Hello everyone, my name is Rich, and you are watching the Indie Plus feed. This is one of our pound game nights, and this is for April, month of April 2013. The subject, this is a panel where we have three um, purportedly funny people who play tabletop role-playing games, and we're going to be talking about bringing the funny uh, to your game. Now, just to kind of intro a little bit, uh, the, the setup for the panel is that around a gaming table, real or virtual, we gamers sit in groups for hours on end, telling stories and rolling dice or throwing cards, what have you. In this immensely social activity, it's important to keep a good sense of humor, to laugh and have a good time. Join us uh, for this panel, where we're going to be talking with these folks uh, who talk about bringing funny to the table when they play. First, I'm going to bring on uh, a man known as Jason Corley. He hails from uh, Arizona. He's been gaming since the 80s. That's 1980s. <laughs> this is found in like the 2100s. 1980s. Yeah. He's the, the founder of the Tucson Game Masters Conference. He self-declared best GM in Tucson and goes by JD Corley on Twitter. Hello, Jason. Hey, everybody. It's great to be here. Oh, man. So, so excited to have you on, Jason. Uh, next up, we have uh, Judd Carlman. Judd's an author, librarian, and a longtime gamer. He's a former host of uh, some podcasts you may have heard of if you're old and play you know, <laughs> And nice. that's called The Sons of Cryos. And he did a short stunt on this small show that's still going, and you can actually find on the internet and listen to, and that's the Cannon Puncture Show. Mm. Pause for effect. <laughs> He's well known in gaming circles for his brilliant actual play lineups and his acerbic wit. It is Judd Carlin. Judd, how are you, sir? Uh, uh, I'm fine, thank you. Thanks All for right. having me on. And we are uh, we're classing up the joint by also having Stacy D. Stacy is a hangout game master, convention organizer, and a budding independent game designer. Currently working on an online convention celebrating women called Contessa, and nice. she's. A silly, self, self-described silly, playful, and adventurous game that she's making called Precious Dark. Hello, Stacy. Hi. Great. Uh, so we're going to talk about tabletop role-playing games and how to to have fun or to bring funny uh, things. Do you have any opening statements that you'd like to, to lead off with about bringing fun? We've got some questions we've crowdsourced from, uh, from our followers. Do, do, do you have like a, a preface? Jason, I know that you've been talking. <laughs> yes, he has extensively. Yeah, well... Um... Uh, yeah, I've kind of done a lot of it. Uh, so I think probably the main thing that people listening to this should know is that talking about being funny is itself never funny. Like, so be, talking about how to, like, create a joke and nail a punchline and talk about timing, um, it's, this is why if you hang out with, like, people who do stand-up uh, and they start talking about their stand-up, it's the most depressing thing that you've ever heard. So, um, if you, uh, I, that's so yeah. sad. <laughs> I, I, I was really, I, I was really surprised to be asked here because the game that I played with Rich was this really grim, terrible game about orcs. And then he was like, "Hey, want to come play a game about being funny?" And I was like, "Your only gaming experience with me was the, like the grimmest, the grimmest <laughs> of the grim orc games. Like it was just." I, I I'm shocked. I, Star Wars Primetime Adventures. Oh, that's true. Fun and funny. That's true. That's true. That's uh, okay, so we'll start with that. Profanity plus Star Wars equals comedy. <laughs> uh, um, that's the the requisite equation uh, for all comedy and all Star Wars games. So there you go. All right. Any any opening statements <laughs> for you, Stacy? Uh, no, I don't think I have anything that I can possibly add to that. <laughs> always has something to add. Go for it, Jim. Wow, put me on the spot much. Holy cow. Darn straight. Uh, I, 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 I agree with Jason that uh, uh, as soon as you put funny in the title, it's it's probably it's going to be very difficult to be funny. Uh, I don't know. I, I, that, 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 that links back to how funny things happen at the gaming table with me, I think, is that um, I don't know. I don't, I don't tend to play f games where there's something funny in the, in the description or something funny in the uh, idea of the game. Like, funny stuff just happens because funny stuff just happens, you know? I mean, it just... I don't, I don't go for jokes. I, I don't go for gags. Uh, I, I just kind of like to throw my friends at crazy stuff and 
let funny stuff just happen. Um, I don't try to hit a punchline or, or make any particular timing. Um, I, I think um, that's a great that's a great way of looking at it, Judd. There's um, I just my cat just started yelling at me. Um, so, it, like, you have either um, a game that can have a funny situation at the start. Like, so you might have, um, you know, a situation that when you describe it to your friends, they just start laughing because the, the, it's ridiculous or it's absurd or something like that. Or you might have a game in which the situation is straightforward, but um, the jokes come out of the characters and their attitude towards the situation. So I guess the difference might be, uh, you know, MASH is, you know, that could be a hospital drama if the characters didn't have the approaches that they had. Right, exactly. Um, but uh, the, you know, if you have like a, a ridiculous premise, um, then that can be an entirely different feeling. Yeah. And with a ridiculous premise, you might have to bring in more down-to-earth characters, you know? Like, I mean, feel like straightforward pre yeah. premise, maybe then you go for the characters right. that are a little bit zanier, you know, but yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm on a cat break. I'll be right back for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I run ex pretty much exclusively right now World of Darkness games, and they're supposed to be gritty and dark and mean, and they usually aren't just because of the players. <laughs> yes, I've, I've watched your, uh, your on-air, Hangouts on-air of uh, World of Darkness games. and <laughs> World of <Sounds>. Darkness. <laughs> 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 what 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 tone ends up coming out? Oh, how do I describe it? I don't even know. Well, okay, the, the there's there's crazy hijinks happen quite, and shenanigans happen frequently. But it's it's usually because the the, the game changeling, um, really kind of um, it, it's like PTSD. The game is is has it has been described as. So all of the characters have these weird like neurological things going on anyway so they have reasons to all have strange quirks and usually when you get them all together and then all those characters try to make a plan to solve a problem the funny comes from just repeating their plan to them mm. I demand examples <laughs> examples <laughs> oh so you, I just told you that the gate that you need to open is underneath the freehold that got destroyed last week, but you're going to go to the Crystal Palace to look for the key anyways because... Oh, I don't know. That sounds like a fun place to go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and uh, player plans them. are... A, yeah, player plans are an enormous source of hilarity because they will take the smallest thing and just run with it off of a cliff. They take it too far. Uh, yeah. That's that's awesome. And then World of Darkness is good for that, for whatever reason. Those games have a, maybe because the setup is so baroque or so complicated, th there's just so many pieces to pick up and pile onto each other. And if you play kind of the, the, the characters, or, or the, the the classes, which are the seemings and the kiths to their, to to what how they're written. It's they're they're a little bit like caricatures in and of themselves. So and you know the courts in and of themselves, and 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 you can play off of that, and it it kind of breaks up the gritty and the darkness a little bit. Oh yeah, I mean, Changeling definitely is the is the is the game of the World of Darkness game where you kind of try to find joy and mirth. I yeah. think in that. Well, that a little place. bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and and Stacy, it looks like Michael, who's watching live, says that the key was under the freehold. How'd we miss that? Uh, is that one of your players? <laughs> I, I explained it to you guys like three times. You're like, oh no, we're still gonna go to the Crystal Palace. Okay. okay. Uh, I can remember a uh, vampire game I, I ran back in the day, um, and I was it was kind of an introductory game. I was sort of getting everyone used to the idea, and um, there was a really core, simple vampire problem, which was some jerk has a vampire on videotape and it's at the local news station. So you, the characters, have to go retrieve this videotape. The obstacle to getting it was literally one security guard, just one, at a desk. And I had already decided, because this is a, uh, you know, introductory, um, uh, introductory situation, that anything, literally anything they did would work. Like, they could talk their way past the guy, they could bribe him, they could use their vampire powers, they could kill him. I didn't care. Because this is an introductory thing. Like, okay, well, whatever you do, it's going to work. They started with, a, like, okay, we need a distraction. 
Okay, and then we need a bigger distraction. And to get that distraction, we need to go steal this other thing. And so it just got more and more elaborate until they were asking me questions like, I wonder what would happen if we got a dump truck full of manure and a city bus with a lot of prostitutes on it, and they crashed in front of the building. <laughs> and then he would come running out, and we would come up pretending to be transit police. And <laughs> Please, just do something, anything. So uh, player plans are a great source of hilarity in, in a lot of games. I, I, I'm, I'm fond of, of, as a GM of saying, like when people are over planning, I, I'm fond of as a GM of being like, I'm really not having fun watching you guys plan for an hour and a half. <laughs> uh, do it, just do it, because I'm just, a player here too. and this we'll is do it live. I, yeah. Do it live. I mean, I make things happen when they take too long. It's like, okay, something explodes, or, or you know, there's a knock on the door, or something along those lines. Time to make a decision. <laughs> I throw a 210-pound tantrum is what I do. I'm just like, this is dull. What are we doing? <laughs> I'm bored. <laughs> Didn't you know your job is to entertain me? <laughs> just do, roll some dice. Jeez. <laughs> My my favorite planning story, not not that I'm a moderator and I should be telling stories, but it's quick. It's <laughs> uh, is Shadowrun game where we spend about half an hour coming up with the perfect plan, and then the uh, uh, the physical adept just snuck out of the back of the van that was parked beneath the building, and, and he the player literally said, uh, "Frack all this role playing, Drake. I'm going to go kill something," and then just went to execute on not a plan to try to force. <laughs> 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 The, the Leroy Jenkins of, uh, of Shadowrun. <laughs> he was Leroy before Leroy was cool. <laughs> nice. All nice. right. Well, now, just, just to kind of lay some groundwork, when, when um, comedy is a theme for this month, and so that's the general thrust, but also, you know, having fun, getting smiles from the players, keeping everybody engaged, that's also an answer that is perfectly valid and acceptable for people like Judd, who, who hates fun. Um <laughs> So. I, I, I don't hate fun. I, I just think, all right, so he, he, he here's the problem with, with, with discussing uh, humor at the table, right? Humor is, 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 is embedded. In, in order for humor to work, is there's got to be context. And gaming is creating context with your friends. So for us to sit here and talk about what is funny to someone else who isn't even here is ridiculous because they don't have the context that we had at the table. Like, you know, I, I understand why Stacy's story is funny, and it, I'm sure it's even funnier to her and her friends. But like, the more removed you get, the less funny the gaming stuff gets. And I'm not, I don't mean just Stacy's story; that's just the only concrete one we have. I mean <laughs> any gaming story. It just like it's just you know. Let me tell you what happened that was funny at my game. Is like you know. Let me tell you about my character. You know, it just is. It, <laughs> uh, it, it, I don't know. It's, there's there's a lot of context there. There's a lot yes. of personalities too yes. that, that you can't necessarily translate into a story. Yep. Well, deferring senses of humor can lead to huge changes in at, at the game table too. My wife thinks puns are hilarious, and you know uh, I'm yeah. like I kind of I kind of you know gorged myself on Piers Anthony between ages twelve and fourteen and. Since then, I have not had a taste for it. <laughs> and oh, it's just like, maybe that's why I had such a bad reaction to puns in the last game that I was in. <laughs> yeah, it could be. And my, but my wife loves it. She loves puns, and she will just shut a game down if necessary, um, it, in order to make sure everybody heard her pun. Um, <laughs> yes, I dear, made a I pun it. the other night about a pansexual satyr. Wah, wah, wah. That's about how it works. Oh, that's <laughs> a like horrible. I like it. I like it. <laughs> wow. I, 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 think the, I think the funniest thing that's happened in my game recently uh, is a game I was just, matter of fact, I just played. Uh, I'm, I'm still at my friend Alexander's house where we gamed. Uh, he's letting me use his computer. So he's, he's playing a wizard's apprentice, and he got told, uh, and in a very magical world, he has killed an elf with magic. And someone was like, oh, well, what's over in... He asked, like, what's over in this city? And it's like, oh, well, that's Valencia. That's where the dragon sleeps. And there are a bunch of wizards there who keep it asleep. He's like, there's no such thing as dragons. <laughs> it's like, you are a wizard's apprentice. How can you not believe in dragons? <laughs> I loved it. This is great. That's my favorite thing lately. Like, that, that 
That was my favorite moment. <laughs> and that's and that's funny in context of a very high magic game, right? Like, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, context yeah. for that joke is there's magic everywhere. Why wouldn't there be dragons? Right, right, right. It's just hysterical. But I mean, the, he's also playing like a, a you know, a, a kid out of the gutter who doesn't know, sh you know, anything. So I mean, when his when his master turned into a bear. He thought it was a monster. I mean, he just did not know what it was. <laughs> it was like, my master can turn into a monster. Um, he's a, that, that character, I think young characters are really good sources of, of humor just because they, they uh, I don't know, kids say, say crazy stuff and they react to crazy situations in really cool ways. And getting to play that just makes for really funny things. Um, particularly if you're playing with someone who works with kids. Uh, I find that then they have all the stuff to draw from, and and it's just kind of fun. My know. husband would be great at that. He he's a, he, he he. We were just talking about kid logic not too yeah, long yeah. ago about how, how the things that kids can put together, and then they're just like, no, this totally makes sense. It's it's completely logical in their world. <laughs> yeah. That's well, they also stuff. have. Well, there's fish out of water type of situations um, that kids can get into. Um, another, and I've, I've done that even with sort of grown-up characters who are in a situation where it's like they have no, like, way of understanding what's happening. Like the character that doesn't know what a bear is, right? Like that guy on a wilderness adventure is a humorous character in that context, in that situation. Um, but uh, you also have, I, I also tend to have characters that are, like, just straight up wrong about what's going on in the game. Um, and that is funny in its own way because everyone else is trying to get on a on the same page in their imagination, and here's one guy who just doesn't quite get it. He just doesn't quite mesh with what everyone else is thinking. Um, so kids can be in that in that realm as well. All right, we're going to transition into some questions. I crowdsourced for some questions uh, from my Google Plus page and also from the Indie Plus page. So if you'd like to contribute to future uh, panels and, and questions we ask of our guests, please uh, follow us and contribute. Uh, JJ Lanza asked, and I, I think, Jason, you kind of dovetailed into this, but how, how is, what's the best way to engage everyone at the table in, in the fun? Wow, that's kind of... That's like saying, I'm a boxer. How do I hit the guy in the head so he falls down and doesn't, doesn't get back down? <laughs> it's really simple. That's all I want to do is I want to hit him in the head and so he doesn't get back up, and I can't figure out how to do that. It seems like it should be easy. That's like that's gaming. I mean, that's what, Dude, that's what yes. game designers study and GMs try to figure out the techniques to do. And go, Jason. You're ready to roll. I can feel it. <laughs> well, you know, you're right. Judd, you're absolutely right. Like, that is the core question of all gaming. It's, like, not just fun or humor or joy or delight or sadness or whatever. It's how do we get everybody on that same page, whether it's in the left-hand side of our imagination when we're trying to figure out the stats of something or the right-hand side when we're trying to, you know, emotionally, uh, you know, feel something together. I, I think for humor, the key is, first of all, everyone has to have, the players have to have the right context. So like that dragon joke, like if I'm someone who hasn't read a lot of fantasy and maybe, you know, maybe I've only watched the Lord of the Rings trilogy, not The Hobbit where there actually is a dragon, but like, and I don't like understand how prevalent dragons are in gaming and fantasy worlds, like that joke doesn't fly for me because I don't have that understanding. So I think the first thing is going to be to get every, all the players understanding what the situation is. Um, and uh, I think humor, I, you know, there's an element of incongruousness to it. So and let, until everybody has that situational understanding, you can't like jolt them with someone who says, there's no such thing as dragons, what's going on? Um, so I think that situational understanding is probably the most important. Like, you just have to understand. Everybody has to know what's going on. Um, Stacy, just to kind of... Uh, what about people who are wallflowers? How do you bring them out of the woodwork to be part of the fun? By calling them out by name and making them answer a question. <laughs> Can you give an example of a good question? <laughs> oh, well, th there, there are occasions that it'll be like, um, so... 
because Michael is watching, I'm going to use him as my example forever. So Michael, um, for instance, what's Franklin doing in this particular situation? And then I'll have him tell me what's going on. Or a lot of that is a lot of that is being able to read your players. I mean, a lot of it is being able to watch their body language and their facial expressions and what they're doing. If it's a hangout game. Are they, does it look like they're, they're checked out? Are they actually, you know, on a web page looking at something? Are they actually paying attention to you? Um, and, you know, in person, it's even easier because you actually, you know, can, can get that kind of vibe from people. And if you see somebody that doesn't seem to be, you know, really responding a lot or getting involved, you do something or you have something happen that forces them to get involved or that pulls them into the into the group. And usually if you have really good players, and, and I've been graced with some really great players, they will, uh, they will, you know, totally bolster around the person who's a little bit shy, and they'll give them reasons to, to come in, and they'll help along, and they'll, they'll be like, oh, yeah, what do you think about this? You know, those kind of things. That, and it's also good to have, like, they need, they, everybody has something that they're really good at, and then if this person who's really good at, say, finding people hasn't been doing much lately, and you want to get them doing something, then you can just really easily introduce that kind of element into the game, and then say, this is, this is almost an episode just for you. I, I, I have an answer for JJ's question uh, that no one likes, but I'll give it anyway. Uh, <laughs> if, if you find that you're not... Uh, Getting good game time with everybody at your table, and that it's it's you're having trouble finding that balance. Um, game with smaller groups. Uh, if, if you're still gaming with a huge too. group and and you're having trouble making your way around, um, break it up into smaller groups. It, it's really 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 fun. One GM and two players. I love that. I like one GM and one player. Uh, I think it's just really fun. Four and five now for me. And I, I mean, I, I gamed in college with like nine uh, players and the GM, uh, you know, back when we were young and gamed for 12 hours of clip. Uh, but now I really like two and three players at a, at a time. It's really fun. You really get to concentrate on stuff. And, and I, my best gaming lately has really been one GM and one player. I love that. It is so much fun. It, it's, it's more like a date than a dinner party, but <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> It I is. like it. That's cool. Um, so uh, if you find you're not getting the, you know, you're not getting all the balance out of it, you're not, uh, you're not touching everybody at the table, uh, and they're not, you know, getting the time they need, um, game with less people. I, I think one pitfall that can occur if you have someone who's a little bit more reticent is, and I am guilty of this myself, um, if someone is reticent, oftentimes they, in a humorous situation, they fall into the role of straight man. And um, because it, being the like the Lou Cost, you know the Lou Costello and the um, but uh, to the Bud Abbott, it's a little more wild. You have to be a little more wacky and out there. And so a lot of times the wallflower will get put in the position of, well, I'm going to feed this guy straight lines so that he can get laughs from the rest of the group. And that is, um, I mean, that can be great. Like I've had people just love that role and really eat up that role. And when people recognize that and give them props for it, they will want to connect with that straight man so that they can get their funny lines out. Um, so that will bring them into the group more fully. But that has to be a choice that they make and not just you know, how it falls because that's the only thing that they're comfortable doing. Um, so I, I would be really careful about roles that you see occurring with wallflowers, especially with respect to humorous situations. And, uh, the, the other thing you can do with somebody who has a, you know, who's having trouble kind of finding a way to, uh, I don't know, interact is give them a role that uh, puts them in a direct relationship. Make them a bodyguard. Make them, uh, you know, put a really outgoing player as their as their servant. Uh, you know, make give them a, a, a social interaction with the game that that bickering that siblings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something concrete. Something they can definitely touch. Good. Um, Josh Manon asks, <clears throat> how do you roll with a running gag without having it roll over your game? Describe a running gag. Uh, a gag that's running? No, so like uh, <laughs> one person does a Monty Python reference, and the next person does the next line from uh. the bit, and then the next person does the next line, and then all of a sudden everybody's just quoting Monty Python, and you're no longer playing the game. You're just yeah. reenacting... Life, you know, See, I didn't interpret the question that way. I, 
interpreted it as you've developed a running gag. Like, let's say there's an NPC um, who, is, like, uh, let's say it's a military game and their boss is just, like, really, really, really by the book. And every time they see him, that he demands, you know, regulation 134.C requires that you file a report within 24 hours. And literally every time they see him, he's bringing up regulation 134.C. Um, because I think running gags can be a big source of comedy if they are from within the game and f flow from the characters. Um, uh, so I took the question to be, I've established this running gag and now it's kind of getting out of control maybe? Um, I would have, I would then just change it up because that in itself is funny too. Like, you know, suddenly the guy is replaced and the person who's af who comes after him is like, oh, what's all these reports doing on my desk? And he throws them all away or something like that. But... Um, I I think running gags and catchphrases can be a lot of fun in a game, um, and uh, you know any Mel Brooks comedy will show you that. Yeah, but that's like two hours versus several yeah. games over weeks and months true, and years. True. <laughs> it's just they could file the form, and then he would not care about the form anymore. <laughs> Is so the the controlling the running gag if it were say Monty Python quotes as a as a GM if you know that that's I'll, tell, I'll tell you what to do I'll tell you what to do again Thanks. you're not going to like it when someone, <laughs> when someone at your table tells a Monty Python joke you kill them and I don't mean their character I mean, you take a sharp pencil you have pencils all over the table pencils are a deadly weapon you put it right through their eyeball you put it right through their eyeball and you just then you just then you just look at everybody like, "What's up? Who's got a Monty Python reference?" Especially if it's Holy Grail. <laughs> you know what? If it's Life of Brian, you can just put the pencil through their hand, and that should be good enough. And it's like a joke. It's like a it's like a Life of Brian joke. So yeah, it's a Life of Brian joke, right? Right. But yeah, yeah. If it's a if it's a whole if it's a Grail joke, man, that's weak sauce. That's weak <laughs> sauce. So on the on the scale of Monty Python crimes, you're saying you've got like um, series two would be like the least serious because it's the most obscure. Right. Then like series one, uh, maybe one of the compilation movies, followed by Life of Brian. Uh, worst offense would be Holy Grail. Now, what about Terry Gilliam movies, Judd? That's the real question. We're getting into hazy ground here, Jason. Uh, you have to decide what kind of people you want to spend your time with, I guess, at that point, really. <laughs> so uh, your, ta your time bandits, uh, your Brazil, all that's off. All that's done. I don't know. Time bandits is pretty awesome. Uh, time, time bandits, bandits is, is pretty awesome, yeah. That's hard. Yeah. You're, making, you're, I... making, you're, you're, you're giving me really hard choices. I'm, I'm sorry, Stacey. Go, go. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just agreeing. <laughs> So, Stacey, just to kind of go with that, when, when everybody's gone off the rails and they're having a great time, how can you refocus the game without sounding like a mean person? Sound like a mean person? No. Uh, well, how can you refocus the game? How can you get everybody I, back on? I usually wait until there's a, a lull because I, if people are having fun and they're laughing and they're, they're doing a, a great job of it, then... It's not something that I have to worry about too much. Um, so I wait until there's a moment, unless it goes really long, but usually it doesn't, until there's a moment when there's a, there's a pause, when everybody has to breathe a little bit or, or somebody is, is thinking about something that they say. And so back to the game or and so on, let's continue or something along those lines. I have a couple of times said, okay, don't make me turn this hangout around. But, you know, usually... People are pretty good at, at, at actually even seeing, noticing when, when the other people in the group are getting bored because they're still going on about whatever joke it is that they were saying or something like that. And then they tend to curtail themselves a little bit. Uh, uh, another thing. Yeah, if the rest of the group is responding... Go, go, go. Go, Jason. Oh. Oh, okay. So if the re I mean, Stacy's right on target. If the rest of the group is responding to it in a negative way, it will stop itself. If the rest of the group isn't responding to it in a negative way, you have to take into account that maybe this joking around is the real goal of why people are there, not necessarily listening to me and my, my brilliant GMing and my wonderful 
plot and terrific characters. Maybe they're there to have fun and hang out more than to listen to me. Um, shocking as that might be to someone like myself. But, um, <laughs> And that's okay too. I mean, if you know, that's that's the kind of game that you're going for. There's something to be said for the beer and pretzels game. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, and, and maybe you know, maybe tonight we just don't game. That's okay. Right. Like you know, yeah. like I, I've had nights where everybody shows up really wound up from a bad day of work, all on the same day, and it's just let's not game tonight. Um, that's okay. Uh, Watch a movie, play a card game, yeah. do anything else other than role-playing games. Yep. So I, I, I hear you, Judd. Um, I once, many years ago, said, hey, if we're just here to hang out and make dick jokes, that's cool. Um, and if that's what we want to do, let's just stop. But if we're here to game, let's actually game. And then my campaign ended. Oh. <laughs> you got an answer. Sir, you didn't get that the answer you answer. wanted. <laughs> <laughs> is there a better? I mean, was was that just the answer? Was that they weren't there to game, or was is there some way that you can approach it without making people feel, well, screw you, then I'll just I'll just sit here and drink my beer. No, but the real, but the real, the real question you're asking there, Rich, is was I an asshole or were they assholes? That's <laughs> the real, real asshole. <laughs> See, I didn't, I didn't give, <laughs> let me give all the context. I was totally oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> The tone in which I said it, because <laughs> I was super pissed off, because I'd work for like hours and hours on an awesome <laughs> game. Yeah, one thing that I found is that you can't take your games too seriously, because nobody else is going to. <laughs> uh, at the same time, though, I'd like to, I'd like to show up and play, you know? Yeah, um, same here. I want to. I want to get when I when I'm there. I want to get going and and actually play the game. I don't want to spend five minutes making puns or or Monty Python references or any of those kind of things. You know, I want the funny to be part of the play. Yeah, and one thing that I'm trying to do in the game I'm about to start is actually having beginning, like not quite. There was a game called Everlasting that had like a candle lighting ceremony as the start of every single session. Um, which, on the one hand, is ridiculous. Like, you just, that's never going to happen. But at the same time, it's like, it's kind of cool. Like, it kind of yeah. gets people to shut up and stop shuffling their dice and papers around. And yep. so I'm kind of thinking of uh, that I need, like, a firm start to the session and maybe, like, a planned break. Saying, you know, we've been, I am going to break this game after an hour and a half and we're not going to play for 15 minutes. Uh, I. I I think making rituals that, that start the game are really, really, really valuable. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember one guy who I gamed with would uh, turn off, he'd have music playing when we came in, and when the music went off, it was time to play. Uh, I like it. And, and that's, that's a great idea. That's, for, that's a real easy one, you know, because, yeah. yeah, there's music on. And then, you know, when he turned off the Pixie CD, let's, let's do this. Uh, I like it. Yeah, that and and the other thing. I mean, then there are other things you can do, like you know, uh, what happened last game? Somebody tell me, you know, refresh me, everybody. What was what was you know wh where were we? Uh, and that's a good way to kind of just get everybody back into that mindset. So, yeah, nice, nice. Uh, the refocus question was from Brennan Reese. Just want to give him uh, some credit there. Did you have anything else to add, Stacy or, or Jason, on that? You no, know, just to, to respond to your example a little bit, I was in a very similar situation with a couple of players in an older group, and when I went and did like a personal one-on-one, -on -one, what do you want out of coming over to my house on Saturday afternoon, they said, I like playing the game, but it is really a reason for me to get together with my friends once a week. So knowing that about their priorities, like joking around is A-OK -okay with them, like, they're not losing anything when they do that, so long as the rest of the group isn't impinged by that preference, then, um, you know, I, then I've got no beef, right? They're there getting what they want out of the situation. Uh, so I find a lot of times if you set your goals and expectations in a situation explicitly, you'll find out who really wants to do it or not. Uh, for example, if you're going to play a game of fiasco, and you say, I want to get through both acts all the way, like, I don't want to have to rush through the last part of the game because everyone's been messing around for, for two hours. 
Um, you know, Wicked Age is another game with chapters, so I don't want to just play one chapter tonight. I want to play two. Um, so that's something that keeps people focused and it gives them a goal to work towards. Very clever. Very nice. Clever. You so far are ahead, Jason. <laughs> Stacy's close behind, though. Um, so, Jim Crockers, we're, we're going to bring the tone down a little bit and talk about something serious in our funny discussion. Jim Crocker has asked, um, so it, this is assumptive. We all know about lines and veils and X cards for serious content, which is generally an idea of uh, a method by which you can say this is off the table or this isn't something that I want to happen at all or during the game this is some signal that I give that I'm uncomfortable with something that's happening. Um, how important is it to have that kind of social contract or that discussion if you don't like the term social contract? How important is it to have those same discussions for funny games? Uh, and it seems like the social pressure to laugh along with everybody else, could that lead to other potential problems. See, I generally don't like X cards or lines and veils or any of those kinds of things for a variety of reasons, but the first of which is that I tend to be pretty picky about who I play with. I play with people that I can trust and who can trust me, and I don't want to have something, a mechanic in the way of me and that person engaging in role play along those, those lines. I don't, I don't tend to run games at cons, and when I do it online even, I, I tend to, to do a little bit of vetting of the people and make sure that I know them a little bit. And I'm not afraid to kick people out of my game who don't seem to fit in. Um, but I also expect that my players are going to act like mature adults and that if they have a problem with something that's said or if they have a problem with a direction that something is going in, that they're going to come to me and tell me. And Hangouts is even easier because they can just send me a private message. They don't even have to tell everybody else that they have a problem with that or that they're, making, they're becoming uncomfortable. They can do it in a private manner. But, you know, that's, that's what I've always kind of expected from people. And it's, it's really the quality of the people that you're playing with that, that sets the quality of the game. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree, uh, Stacy. I think that's a great way to handle it. Um, you know, our relationships at the gaming table are really important. Um, as I mentioned, I game with my wife. I game with my best friend who I've known for, gosh, 20 years now. Like, there's literally nothing I can say at all that can come out of my mind that will shock either of those two or, or outrage them in any way um, just because we know each other so well. Um, but if I have a new person in the group, I treat them kind of like I, I would treat, you know, uh, inviting a stranger to, to see a movie or recommending a book to someone. I wouldn't recommend, like, a really um, graphic, gory you know, serial crime mystery to someone that I just met because I don't know if that person is sensitive. I don't know if that person is interested in that kind of thing. Um, and I think similarly for humorous situations, right, you're not going to want to crack a joke that you don't know how they're going to take it. Um, and if you don't know how they're going to take it, you, you should just avoid it just like you would any other interaction with that person. The introduction of a role-playing game into your relationship doesn't change that relationship. It doesn't make you, doesn't give you more trust in them or vice versa. Stacy, anything to add? And that the trust level is what's really, really important. And I think that's really what makes funny games funny is that you know everybody feels comfortable enough around the t table that they can that they can say whatever <laughs> comes to mind. They can make whatever stupid joke comes out. I mean, somebody mentioned um, Cards Against Humanity in the last panel and that some people, you know, wouldn't want to play that. You know, and that's and that's another one of those kind of situations where people kind of know what they're getting into when they get into these things. And, and if it's something that, you know, if, if, if somebody came into my game and didn't know who I was, I would be really surprised considering how much crap I post on Google+. Plus. You know, and, and I talk a lot about what kind of game I have and, you know, what kind of themes I like and, and those kind of things, what I don't mind. And, you know, if somebody really had a problem with that and still came in and played my game, I'd be really surprised. <laughs> Truth so, in advertising. <laughs> what, um, let's say that you've had those conversations, but for whatever reason, it just so happens that someone is suddenly uncomfortable with where the humor has gone. How do you deal with that? 
What would you do at the table when that when that happens, Stacy? I don't know because that actually hasn't ever happened to me, and I think that's a situational kind of thing. You know, it's not something that you can really say. This is what I would do anytime the situation happens. It's it's if the joke is already over, it, it really depends too. I mean, if somebody made a really really racist joke or really really overtly sexist joke that wasn't just them fooling around with me or wasn't just funny, you know, for the sake of being funny, I would call them out on that. You know, I would be the one who said, that's just not cool. And depending on how bad it is, I might actually kick them out of the table because I just am not going to, I'm not going to play with people who do those kind of things. But, you know, if it's something that it's just makes somebody mildly uncomfortable, they're, they're talking about something that, that, that they don't really like to talk about, then usually you can just let the moment pass, and if it try, starts to go back to that direction, then, then just kind of steer away from it and, and keep moving along the, those ways. I don't like the idea of, like, calling out somebody's discomforts in front of the entire group. It, it's, it's, I think that's worse than, than you know, than, than letting them deal with it on their own. Uh, so, Judd, let's say that um, say that I, I'm a little upset that someone's made a joke about my work in the Burning Wheel game. Yeah. What, how are you going to approach Jim about that? Well, I mean, orc bigotry is a really serious societal problem, Rich, and uh, I think we would need to confront that head on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so has this has this happened I, to you? Has I, anyone ever so, said I'm a little uncomfortable with what's going on? Or you got that look from someone where they're like, Ugh. "What do you do? Have you I, done that?" I once the trust is broken, I found it's kind of hard to get it back. I've definitely had games where where it's busted, and then there were people just don't game together anymore. Yeah, and that's just yeah. the way it is. I've uh, quit I mean, games how, for that. How, yeah. yeah, how can you how can you get back together and like with that? How can you invite those people into your home and and go to their home and sit around and make stuff up and be comfortable when you can't trust them. It's just done. It's just done. And that's okay. You know, you got, I've got to respect my friend's uh, desire to say, I don't want that person anywhere near me anymore. Uh, yeah. And that's totally cool. I've done it. I've done it. And I've had friends who've done it. And that's all right. Uh, it doesn't always have to be some kind of thing where it's like, well, let's really confront it and sit down and try to come to kind of some kind of consensus and educate the ignorant. And it's like, well, you know what? It's not my job to educate the ignorant. Uh, I, I'm really tired. Not in a game with orcs. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but, I mean, a game but, about magic and elves and orcs, and the, that's not what I want to talk about. Right. Well, I mean, even if I do have really serious stuff going on in my game, that's even more reason not to have that person at the game. Yeah. Uh, right. I mean, right. because, you know, I don't know. So I mean, if if Rich came to me and was like, "I'm really upset about this joke that was made," uh, I would I would, you know, think back to that time and figure out if it was something we could resolve or not. And if not, just, you know, I'll get together with Rich in some other way, and I'll get it. You know, if that part, you know, we'll figure out. We'll figure it out. Because uh, I, I don't want to force people to sit down at a table who don't trust one another. That's just a recipe for disaster. Uh, I've done it, and it ends up it ends badly. Always. Well, I don't know, like, because I run a lot of con games, and they're people who I don't know, let alone right. trust. Yeah. I know nothing right. about them, but I treat right. them like I would a stranger, and I don't yeah. rely on them to do things I wouldn't rely on a stranger to do, which means basic decency and, you know, things like that, which sometimes is too much to ask, but... Um, most of the time when I rely on them to be just a normal, decent person, people at cons are normal, decent people, and, and that's fine. But I certainly wouldn't put any kind of, like, really serious content into it or really, uh, uh, for the humor topic, really envelope-pushing jokes, right? I wouldn't do that either because I don't know them. I don't know how they're going to react. I might be the jerk in that situation. I probably am. Um, but the, or it might be they're too sensitive, or maybe that I'm the jerk, or a combination of both, you don't know. You know, I think it just gets back to the addition of a role-playing game to your relationship with another person doesn't change that relationship. Right. If it's not a joke you would crack with them just standing there, like, talking, you shouldn't crack it through the voice of a character or in the creation of a situation as a GM if you wouldn't do it just to their face in normal conversation. 
Nice. Well said. Kelly Vanda asks, um, <clears throat> do you have any tactics for balancing an otherwise serious or dramatic game with humor? How do you tell when it's an appropriate moment to take a, to make a joke that will blow off steam without killing momentum? Timing. How do you how do you codify timing? Like, how does someone get timing? That's like asking the the boxing question. <laughs> it's it's like you can't. You just know, you know. It, this this seems like a good time. You can feel the tension building up, and and you can feel the. The, God, this is heavy. It's, you know, weighing down on your players. Then, then you know that it's time to, to let's let's laugh about something and have something silly happen instead of all this serious crap. I made one of my characters cry once. The story was so sad, <laughs> and I was like, okay, time to move on. Time to move <laughs> on. Yeah. Time to say something funny or do something else. I had the I, character I, cry or the player. The player. Okay. Well. Both probably. I mean, I mean, she was. It was. It was a really sad story, you know. But but you know, it wasn't horrible crying. It was like crying at a sad movie crying. But you know, it was still okay. This is too heavy now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chad, you were gonna say something. Yeah, I think the the way to learn this stuff is to make do it and make a lot of mistakes, and you're gonna blow some moments, and yep. some moments are gonna you're gonna rock, and you just have to. Do it and make a you know you're going to be making a lot of mistakes with friends and meaningfully reflect afterwards and think about what could have been better and how it could have been better and then just keep doing it. I mean, there, there, there's nothing else. You, you're going to make mistakes. It's this weird, you know, chemistry of of you know a bunch of people sitting around taking turns saying stuff and it's you know some days it's really good and some days it's it's just good. And uh, figure out how how you're making it really good, and keep doing that. Or you know, put a lot of tools in your toolbox, and and you're gonna have to take chances and make mistakes, and that's okay. Like you know, your friends are there to to help. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times a joke has fallen flat, or I thought it was the right moment for something silly to happen, and everybody was just like, eh, that was just dumb, or, you know, whatever, it happens. And then eventually you just start getting your feet underneath yourself, and you're able to read the group a little bit more. The more that you play with the same group, the more that that'll happen, too. I, uh, my style of humor in games that have, like, a humorous sort of situation to them, I try to be the straight man as much as I can as the GM. Like, I try to just play the situation and play the characters as real as I can. And this is after a couple of failures where I kind of, like, made too many wacky NPCs and too many wacky things happen, and there was no place for the comedy to go back down from. So, like, we would just keep escalating and escalating and escalating funniness, but there was no way to bring it back down to earth and start another situation so the game blew up. So I in my games typically I'm usually the straight man and so um, I, when there's a need for a release of tension because of a dramatic scene I can count on one of the other players to be the one to do that. They know that that's not my role that I'm not going to do that. Um, that they are going to be the one to have someone crack a joke, or maybe a player will say something that's funny to, to you know, break up the situation, even if their character doesn't. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm always, like, deadly serious, because obviously I, you know, part of being a straight man is you present absurd situations in as straightforward a way as you can, um, but they know that I am going to try to keep the game real and in some sort of reality. Um, and so I... It may just be the dynamic that I've set up with my players, but um, that really puts it in their hands that, like, if they need a joke to move on to the next thing, then they, they feel that they can do it. Do you find, Jason, that just in your experience, most most groups need a joke when it gets too heavy? You know, it depends on why the group's there. Again, like, I have a very casual group. They like to get together. They like to hang out. Even though we don't have quite as casual a group as I described earlier, that group has kind of split up and we've got some new people in and so on. Um, in general, it's a, it's a very casual group. So as a result, yeah, they do a lot of joking around. Like I can think of 
of a horror game, and the typical example that I always give when people are talking about horror games is, you know, my character screams in terror. He scrabbles at the door. Um, he yells and tumbles down the stairs. Pass me the Doritos. <laughs> you know, like they are not afraid at all. They have no like terror in that situation. They're enjoying the horror game. They're having fun with the horror game, but they themselves are not feeling those emotions. So when you have a casual game where they're not feeling their character's emotions quite so much, it it's just not as um, it's not as serious a situation. You know, you know what's interesting. Good, linking back to something that I said earlier about playing with less people, I think the the, the joking and the the way joking happens changes a lot depending on what level of people. You know, if you have nine players, there is a certain amount of the, you know back and forth joking and out of game joking, and then you get down to like six, and then four, and then two, and then one. Um, it's very different. The way humor works in those kind of group dynamics, different group dynamics, is is just entirely different. Uh, when there's one player, there's only one person that that person can joke to, and that's you. Right, 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 right. And and yeah, it's just very yeah. The the, the audience gets the audience all skews one way or the other. <laughs> so yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I just hadn't thought about it, and then Jason said a bunch of interesting stuff. Cool. I have a thought. I I have always realized that people have to make a certain amount. Of, like I played World of Darkness games for forever. Um, for those who listen to my show, you know that I talk about my seven-year-long vampire game, because I was just that masochistic. Um, but but now I'm playing Hangout games, and you've got this whole chat line, right? And, and the text chat becomes that release valve in a lot of ways. And it's amazing that I can get as much gaming in a two-hour time frame as I got in 13 hours back in college because there's no need for the smoke break and the step away and the joke that takes everybody off track because you've got that release valve. And it's, it's come to make me wonder if if side jokes at the table are really communicating something different. If, if it's people want to turn to talk or they want to contribute but they don't know how and, and having this other tool that's on the side that doesn't take away the main feed has been really interesting to see how it changes the dynamic of the table. Uh, one experiment that I did in my last game, and it was, we only kind of did it halfway because only a couple of people really got into it, it was a superhero game. I used the Marvel Heroic role-playing system, which just came out, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, chill. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, one of the ideas of the game was um, in the Marvel Universe, uh, and in the DC Universe for that matter, superheroes are celebrities. So I had a Twitter feed for the publicist that was helping the team, the superhero team, and then the superheroes themselves had Twitter feeds. So, oh, nice! I was when in a they, very short-lived Shadowrun game where, where all of our characters had Twitter feeds, too. That was really cool. It was a lot of it, fun. It that is, is awesome. It, it is hilarious, and the Twitter feeds are really good. I wish I could have gotten everybody to do it. I think only about maybe half really got into the Twitter feed. I certainly did. But it, I, you're right. It kind of gives you this way of joshing around on a meta sort of... Uh, not quite out of character, but... But like, not a hundred percent of the Twitter Twitter feed existed in that universe. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it yeah. was. It, it kind of had that same idea as the chat that you mentioned, Rich. That it was like people could say something without disrupting the game, and later we could go back and look at it and remember that moment and all laugh. That's a great um, idea. It reminds me of like in the of. Uh, I think it was with great power had thought bubbles. You could like grab the thought bubble. Exactly. Ooh. Exactly. The thought bubble and with great power. Yeah. 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 Uh, and it, it's at, at Chimera Agency, if you want to go look at it. We just finished, so it's it's all wrapped up. Awesome. Nice. That's really cool. I Since we're down a rabbit hole, I'm just going to follow up to say that in the Monster Hearts game that I'm playing in, the, the chat box is actually... That's where we put the text messages that our player characters send to each other. Oh, oh my goodness. goodness. That's amazing. Yeah. That's oh, my great. Lord. Like, one of the players saves the chat logs because what's hilarious is at the moment that one person is talking to the other, having this total heart-to-heart, -heart, a text message from that same player will go to somebody else going, hey, you want to hook up later? 
<laughs> it is so good. It's so, so good. I, I think that, that, that's really interesting technique stuff that I hadn't thought. I haven't done a lot of Hangout gaming, uh, and, uh, and that might change now that I just bought a brand new shiny iPad. And, and ooh, yeah, that's how I feel. I'm like, woo, every time I go home, I'm like, woo, let me turn it on. Let me rub it on my face. Uh, but There's a lot of oils on your face, Chad. There are, there are, but... The backside. Take, take <laughs> and uh, that's really interesting. Like, I think that the, the, the different techniques for Hangout games and the different uses for the, for the window, for the... Uh, for the IM screen, that's really neat stuff. That's cool. We had in Steam and Crumpets, so it's, you know, it's a it's a steampunk game set in Victorian era. There's no text messaging, but the players would actually role play in the chat. They would actually continue the scene. So if they were all at tea and there was like a big important conversation happening, there'd still be like three or four players that were actually engaged in stealing cookies from each other and pouring each other's tea and having oh, this nice. whole conversation going on. It was really, we got to the point where we had to start saving all of the chat logs because anybody watching the games was missing like half of the context of everything that was going on. Nice, nice. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, we could do a whole thing on Hangout <laughs> Games. I'm sure Stacy's got tons of awesome yeah. techniques. Oh. All right, I'm going to bring us back on as we're coming uh, close to the end. And uh, uh, So Joe Prince asked, um, how much respect should you give the fourth wall in a comedic game? You know, that question, I, I should have asked you this earlier, but that question is like, what is the fourth wall in a, in, a, in a game? If you're talking about theater, the fourth wall is the audience, but who's the audience in your game? Wow, this just blew my mind. <laughs> I know, it's, it's great. I love that question. It's really like thought-provoking because, uh, I, yeah, I... it's hard because a lot of, in this is something that happened in my last game, and I'm trying to think of ways of dealing with it in this game because I felt in the last game that there were so many really funny things that were said that were not said in character. So like someone says something and I'm not sure if it's in character or if it, their player is saying it and I have a character in the world respond to it in a way that, you know, like I say, I you try to make it real try to, and make it grounded and uh, they're like, no, 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 I didn't say that. And like I couldn't really tell what was happening. So to an extent, I feel like I want to throw up a little bit of that fourth wall in my next game so that I can hear the voices of the characters as distinct from the voices of the players. Yeah. Um, and like I, I feel like I want a little bit of a fourth wall. Uh, and yeah. I want the jokes to be inside the world or the drama or the fear or whatever to be inside the world rather than necessarily something that we throw into it from, from outside. Um, but yeah, I loved that question. I don't have a good answer for it, but I love that. That's a great question. Yeah, it, it, I, I wrote. I don't know if you if you remember, uh, N World had like a story hour form where you could like write stories, not an actual play post, but like a story about your game. And I wrote my story hour for uh, uh, for that when I was running when I was playing a, a fourth edition D and D game, and the character uh, from was, it was from his point of view, and he knew he was a D and D character. He knew he was not. A, he's like, I know this sounds like I'm a character in a novel. I am not. I'm a D and D character. That means I have a player who I rely on to get anything done. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I've got all this backstory. I want to tell you about it. I can't yet because it just doesn't. It just doesn't have anything to do with the dungeon we're going into. But maybe we'll get to it. Um, and then, like you know, when when months would go by in the game, he'd be like, "I haven't played in months. I'm still third level because the, my player is a graduate student, and he just won't get to the game table. It's ridiculous. And it's fun. It's it, it can." I, the, there's something there. There is definitely something there about a character who knows that they're a character in a game. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. A lot of uh, the jokes of Toon, uh, same way. Like, Toon characters know their cartoon characters. Um, so, of course, they don't know their RPG cartoon characters necessarily, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, so real yeah, quick, uh, uh, Brian E. Brian Rumpf just wants to let you know, Judd, that you can clean the screen, or maybe he was telling me. Um, thanks for that that feedback. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me uh, let me get my finger and just clean it off for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna end uh, with the.
questions that we've received so far, unless someone throws one on the Indie Plus, Google Plus uh, Hangout on Air, uh, we've got one from Chris Tregenza. Uh, we all know that a few beers or smokes can make a social occasion more fun. What role does alcohol and drugs play in making games fun? Uh, none. If you can't have fun without drugs and alcohol, then you're probably doing something wrong. Uh, I tend to not be, like, I think I'm funnier when I've had a couple of glasses of wine, uh, but I am not. Uh, I'm not, actually. So, um, it's a wine talking, right? Exactly. Exactly. I don't, yeah. I don't actually drink at all. So, I mean, that's, that's like, something that has never really come up for me. I know a lot of people like to have, like, a beer before a game to loosen up. But I used to kick people out of my WoW raiding guild for showing up to raids drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Or stoned, actually. I think I, I kicked a couple of them out that, that must have been stoned. <laughs> Don't drink and rage. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that, I mean, and I can understand, I mean, that's a, a, a game of, the raids are like, have a lot of planning, and you have to be like, on top of your game right. to do that. So if you have a competitive element to your game, you don't want any kind of thing that's going to reduce your performance, right? So... If this is a like D and D game where we are just going to be brutally killed if someone's not pulling their weight, yeah, you don't want to have any of that stuff because you miss one step and you're all dead. Um, I don't know. It's a, it really is up to the individual person. I think. You're 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 grown ups. Put put in your body what you want to put in your body. I don't know how to answer that. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I don't. And, uh... Uh, if we're going to talk about drugs on air, uh, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> do you do drugs, Billy? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Okay, well, um, first of all, I just want to say a big thank you to all three of you for, for being part of this. And I just want to give a moment for those who think you're pretty awesome, uh, along with me. Um, we'll start with Stacy. Stacy, where can people find out more about you or projects that you're involved in? Um, the, the biggest thing that I'm involved in right now that I'm pipping is obviously Contessa, and um, the URL is in the bottom of my lower thirds right there, so you can go there to find information about it. Um, we'll be opening registration for events as soon as I finish the registration form. Um, and um, it's it's an online convention, just like India Plus is. It'll be running over four days, and it's meant to um, it's meant to celebrate the women who game. Everybody who runs an event is going to be female, or some persuasion or another, and um, and that's that's going to be pretty awesome because I want them to come in and kind of um, um, show what, off what they're good at. Because um, we we end up women end up talking a lot about what it's like to be women who game, and we don't get to talk as much about the fun things that we like to do in gaming, and that's what Contest is all about. Cool. Nice. Judd, uh, where, where can people find out more about you and stuff that you're involved in? Uh, I've got a blog about gaming called Gip Yankee Diaspora, and uh, if you Google that, you should get there. Or, 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 I don't know. If you, if you don't, find, tell me where you get. I want to know. Where, where did you, what did you find? I'm fascinated. Uh, yeah, that's where I'm. That's that's mostly what I'm doing lately is blogging. Uh, I, I I just got, I just moved and started a new job, and I'm figuring out my writing rhythm. So uh, more more projects will will be coming down the pike, but not for a while. Nice. nice. Uh, and then Jason Corley, where can people find out more about you and what you do, sir? Uh, I have coming up uh, in May, I'm doing a presentation on probability for game designers. Um, so if you have ever like looked at a role-playing game and was really excited about it and then discovered that the dice just didn't work, like they didn't have any of the results that you thought they should have, um, I am going to be doing um, just a super basic ultra introductory level on how you calculate probabilities and what that means for game design. And the first one is going to be held in May. And if you want to be a part of it, um, just uh, post in the comments to the Indie Plus, and I'll invite you to the community. Um, I think that if you search for it, I believe it's under Probability for Game Designers on G+, but I'm not 100% sure Google's going to find it for you. So just post in the comments here, and I'll be happy to get you involved. I want to be invited. Awesome. You're in. <laughs> nice. Thank 
all three of you, and thanks everyone who's watching. Please give us feedback on the YouTube channel and keep the keep yourself following Indie Plus. In March, we'll be talking about magic. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Bye.